Oh, we're live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson now back in London, in London. I'm happy to say. Yes. Great, excellent. Calling Rick Byer in Chicago. I am here, and we want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help, assistance, and uh, you know, uh, various efforts of Stephen Ambrose historical tours. You know, and, well, oh, go ahead. Yes, well, and, and, I, I, all, and. and all of the wonderful folks who have uh, subscribed through Patreon. We can't thank you enough for your support. And, right, and uh, we want to add a special thank you to yeah. our Top Shelf patrons uh, who get their names here along with the bottle of HHH very high quality <laughs> brown drink. Well, and I hope that they can, they can stay and see, you know, the effects of their of their help because yes, we have this they, new website and that's all beautiful. We appreciate that we have a brand new website, a brand new look for the show, and that is all thanks to our Patreon uh, patrons, and we really do appreciate that. And yes. you know, Chris and I may be traveling the globe, but wherever we are on Sunday, we're here with you most of the time. I interrupted you. Oh, that's the second time in the first minute. What, well, what were thing. you going to say? Nothing. I was Nothing. just going to say thank you. Yeah. Just, just go on. You're so nice. You're a very yeah. nice guy. Uh, who have we got with us today, Chris? Watching. And Chris is frozen. But we have uh, Marcus, I see, is with us. And, oh, well. Uh, Wally Morrison. Yeah. And uh, uh, Stephen, Stephen Dean. Dean. Uh, Jim Latin Green. is here. Uh, Let's yeah. compete. You name it fast enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Skip Cornett, uh, uh, Skip, got your got your letter, Skip. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we got a, a good crew of people here. Do we have enough that we can actually get started? Do you think, Chris? I believe so. Are you ready? Uh, all right, I'm, I'm ready to give it a shot. <laughs> bar is open the bar is open and before chris we get to our first our, our topic for the day which is the uh the burma theater of world war ii and our great guest uh rob lyman who's going to join us uh it is my sad duty to report that we have lost one of the dwindling number of uh ghost army veterans from world war ii uh, Stanley Nance, who was the oldest surviving veteran of the unit, passed away this morning at age 103. He served in the radio deception arm of the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops. Uh, I met Stanley about 15 years ago. He was featured in the Ghost Army documentary. And in fact, Chris, he said one of the, one of the outstanding quotes from that documentary came from Stanley Nance right near the end. I've quoted it a thousand times. I think a thousand and one will be okay but I'll let Stanley say it himself. One mother or one new bride was spared the agony of putting a gold star in their front window. That's what the 23rd headquarters was all about. I got to know Stanley really well and uh, got to travel to Europe with his family several times. And of course his great granddaughter uh, Madeline Christensen is our intern working with us here mm -hmm. on History Happy Hour. And you know, Madeline's a high school senior. She's done a tremendous amount of work uh, uh, as a lobbyist in our effort to get this unit awarded a Congressional Gold Medal. And earlier this week, the Senate unanimously passed that gold medal legislation. Congratulations. The Senate doesn't do too many things unanimously these days. No. <laughs> they don't. Uh, and I'm happy to report that, that Stanley's family was able to tell him that. Uh, he knew Good. that and knew that this honor was now, uh, this recognition was about to happen uh, uh, when it's signed by the president, hopefully early next year. And so uh, I'm grateful that uh, he lived long enough for that. And we have nine veterans left in this unit. Hope they get that bill passed before we lose another one. But let's mm -hmm. hoist a glass and toast Staff Sergeant Stanley Nance. Farewell. Sure. Mm. And now, now, on to today's topic. Yes, well, um, I'm going to sound a bit like a fanboy because I guess I sort of am, but I'm very excited uh, to rep, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Lyman. He's one of the UK's leading uh, military historians. He's the author of 15 best-selling books, including one of my all-time favorites, Slim Master of War, about uh, General Slim. Uh, he appears frequently on the BBC, and he was their historical consultant for the VJ Day celebrations. 
Um, and in addition to all that, he is a veteran of 20 years service. And we're here to talk about his new book, um, A War of Empires, Japan, India, Burma, and Britain, 1941 to 45. How was that? That was, that was pretty good. That's yeah. pretty good. All right. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty good. Rob Lyman, welcome to the welcome. Happy Hour. Rick and Chris, what a privilege to be with you tonight. See? That He's is a, fabulous. He, he, I know. It's, it's the height of his career. So. I, this it is. is. <laughs> I love your show. It's all downhill after this. Did you bring a cocktail, Rob? I've, I've got some neat whiskey, which will sustain me for the next hour. I've bought one of my favorites, a Glenlivet, which is... Um, um, Matured nice. in American oak casks, and it gives nice. it a really nice sort of sweet touch. And you uh, explain okay. why it's particularly appropriate that you have a drink in the room that you're in. Ah, yes. Well, the the room you can see here is my study, and it has about half of my books. And this is an old pub. It was a pub built in, believe it or not, this is really quite helpful for you guys, 1776. Oh, cool. what was that? Yeah, a room full of really history a books to drink about in a bar. <laughs> I'm going to throw some dates at you. 1776 <laughs> is a really good one to start with my audience tonight. And uh, we bought it 10 years ago as a bit of a wreck. We rebuilt it. And I'm sitting in what was the saloon bar. So, um, Excellent. That's pretty yeah. cool. It's pretty I cool, like isn't that. it? Excellent. Yeah, Chris, you, you brought a cocktail of some kind, I assume. I, well, I always do. You know, so I have some very strongly fortified Excellent. coffee, actually. Come on. I have a nice, nice uh, dark beer here in, in my PSYOPs class, uh, mm-hmm. Persuade, Change, and Influence. Okay. All right. Getting on to the top, okay. topic at hand. Yes. yes. All right. So there's a lot to unpack here, and, it's a, uh, and we're going to try to get into as much of it as we can. Uh, but I wanted to start with, um, you say that the story of the Burma campaign is also, in part, a story of the birth of independent India, which is not a take on this that I usually hear, so... What do you mean by this? And, and let's get going. Okay. Well, look. Let's let's unpack a bit by bit. One of the most amazing things about the Second World War is that you know, as we look at it, we um, we often fall into the trap of compartmentalizing it. So we think about the Pacific, and we think about the Middle East, and we think about North Africa and the Mediterranean or Northwest Europe theater operations. Um, very, very few people actually spend any time thinking about it as a global conflict. A number of people do, my friend Richard Overy does, and, and, and so on. But what most people miss out is the importance of what is known in Britain as the Far Eastern Theatre War, often just known colloquially as the Burma campaign, and in American circles as the CBI Theatre, the China, Burma, India Theatre. And people ignore it because it is seen to be peripheral to the whole business of defeating the Japanese and defeating the Axis forces. I argue that it's actually fundamentally more important than that from a military perspective. It's much more important from a grand strategic perspective. But it's also really important for from the perspective of India as a whole, because in a nutshell, the army that fought the Japanese in uh, on land, excluding excluding China on land in Burma and India was primarily Indian. And this was an army made up largely of Indians. 87% of the 14th Army were Indian soldiers. Um, And they were soldiers of the legally constituted government of India. They were fighting for India against an enemy that threatened to invade India. And this Indian concept is just so often ignored. Do you know what? It wasn't ignored at the time. It wasn't ignored immediately after the the war. But in the years since, we've lost a really important perspective on the war in the Far East, which is that it was Indian. And it's a really important point that I make. I'll rush to it now, which is that actually because this army was Indian and it was a very, by 1944, 1945, this Indian army was very large. It was the largest volunteer army in the world two and a half million men and women joined the indian army during the second world war unlike any other army that fought then uh, before or since and they fought largely for india to defeat the enemies of india the en- major en- enemy of india uh, attacking in- in, uh, india's borders at the time of course was japan and this is really important to understand why is it important for India as a new country. Well, at the time, India was moving quite slowly, well, actually in historical terms, very rapidly from its colonial status to independence. It gained its independence in 1947. 
when it gained its independence, I know we had partition after that, we'll leave that for a moment. When India gained its independence, one of the most important structures in any civil society, one of the important components of national identity is its army. India had a whole series of um, important constructs, legal constructs, civil service, um, infrastructure constructs, and an army, all really important parts of civil society, very important parts of nationhood, those were inherited by the new India. And a really important thing about 1944 and 1945 is that this Indian army defeated the Japanese. This was an Indian army that was phenomenally successful in battle against the Japanese. In India in 1944, because the Japanese invaded India, many of you won't know that, but they did, they invaded India. Uh, and also in Burma, when the Indian army came smashing into Burma in 1945 and destroyed the Japanese comprehensively. So we have a victorious Indian army in 1945 moving into an independent India. And the really, really amazing thing about the whole of the Indian army story is that virtually nothing changed in the Indian army thereafter. We had partition in 1948 between India and Pakistan, what is now India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. But in both, and actually in those three countries, the army that currently exists is a mirror of what they inherited in 1947. Look, if it wasn't for that dramatic success in 1944 and 45 against the Japanese, you know, so much more would have been different. If you think about uh, going into independence uh, with a failed army, with a failed state, you know, all those things fragmenting around you, it would have been very, very different. I don't go into that in a massive amount of the book. I make the assertion at the end. I tell the story of how successful this remarkable Indian army was. And that's the really important thing for me. Uh, when I first started looking at the Japanese side of the story, I'll just tell you the story. I went to Japan in 2000 to interview some veterans. And uh, the Indian veterans, I, after a couple of weeks, I suddenly realized what they were going on about. They were telling me that they had been defeated by Indians. And that really annoyed them. They had <laughs> gone into India. They had gone into Southeast Asia. To the Jap this, Japanese veterans? Yeah, Japanese yeah. veterans. Veterans of the Japanese war. And to be, you know, to be go, and, and all your listeners will know that, of course, the war was a deeply, insidiously racist enterprise where the Japanese were trying to create this co prosperity sphere, which was, you know, a new element of the Japanese empire. I can talk about actually how silly that was, really, because the Japanese invasion of the Far East in 1944, 1941 was the end of their empire. It wasn't the start of it. You know, they'd been fighting for four years in China, really hard years in China. And their invasion of the Far East was their last gasp, effectively. Very few people really understand it, but it was the last gasp of their empire. And it was it was the last gasp because it failed miserably. Actually, it was a tactical success, a massive strategic failure. But the to be defeated by those Asians or those Asiatics who they'd gone to rescue from colonialism <laughs> was really, really disappointing to them, to these Japanese soldiers who I interviewed in 2000. And it's taken me a number of years of talking to Japanese and Indians to really understand how important this was to Japanese society. Um, we all talk about national exceptionalism. Uh, it's, a, it's a phrase bandied around quite a lot. But actually, Japan did this, did have this very, very dramatic sense of itself in, in 1941. And it needed to res not rescue it, but it wanted to bolster it by... Um, uh, uh, by developing its empire in the Far East in 1941, which is the cause of the, the invasion of Southeast Asia. And, and Pearl Harbor was a peripheral part of that. Uh, they didn't invade uh, Pearl Harbor because Pearl Harbor was important to them. They wanted to prevent the American Pacific fleet from interfering in their invasion of Southeast Asia. That's the important part of that relationship. But um, be then defeated by the people you were going out to save. Oh, that was a very That's difficult awkward. thing for the Japanese to deal with. Um, Rob, I, you know, first of all, shocked to find out that it wasn't all Alec Guinness uh, <laughs> winning the war, because I think that that probably for many Americans, pretty much bridge over River Kwai is our entire indoctrination into the uh, war in the Burma theater. So, um, I mean, I think even locating Burma on a map is challenging for a yes. lot of people. And I'm yes. throwing up a map here. Quick, find Burma. It's towards yeah. the left. Oh, yeah. uh, can you give us an overall sense of what this campaign is about, why yeah. it is being fought? And I yeah. have, and you can call me for this, I have a, a, a closer in uh, uh, 
kind of topographical map of Burma, uh, if you want to kind of explain a little bit about what's going on. I couldn't find, there's too many arrows in this campaign, <laughs> so I couldn't find one map that showed everything. But tell us what's going on here. Well, uh, let me tell you that well done for getting this map because it talks about the Japanese empire. Um, the re One word, one word, and that word is China. Right, so let's just really sort of go back to the start. China, uh, Japan had been had this very, very strong sense of itself and its national identity. Um, it was a very new state, actually, from the Meiji Restoration in 1867, 1868. Uh, and, and many new states, like that of Germany in 1870, need to create a sense of unity. Uh, they need to create a sense of itself. They need to create a national story, this narrative that explains who they are, where they're going. And Japan was exactly the same. To cut a very long story short, we had a story from the 1860s really through um, through a number of significant stages, not least all 1984-95 in the war with Russia, where uh, militarism as a concept and as an idea dominates very significant parts of Japanese society, such that the idea develops that um, the Japanese empire, well, we should have an empire because everyone else has got an empire. The real, the really big countries in the world, America and particularly Great Britain, have empires. Why shouldn't we have a, an empire as well? We have the sense of um, Shinto exceptionalism, you know, racial exceptionalism that says that we are more significant as a people. We've achieved much more than our neighbors who are just basically our slaves and servants. Domination of Korea is a very significant part of that story. And from 1931, um, the um, the Manchuria incident, which created the Japanese client state of Manchukuo, carried on that sense of um, imperial development with racism at the heart. It's really a, it's a complex story, but that's that's it in a nutshell. Then in 1937, we had uh, the expansion of the war through the Marco Polo incident, which was basically an exercise by Mutaguchi Renya, who is a Japanese commander, to get the army more involved in creating a Japanese empire on land in China. Uh, and by 1941, we had you know, a situation where four years had been going on of Japanese aggrandizement in China. We'd have terrible depredations. And in China, we had the Nanking incident or the Nanjing massacre, which you all know about in 1937. The, the Japanese were very, very, um, behaved very, very badly to the, the, the Chinese population. So China was actually incredibly important. And I have to say, I hand it to Roosevelt in particular, the Americans supported China from the beginning against the Japanese. They recognized that, look, if you're going to develop an empire, there are lots and lots of ways of doing it. Doing it by military aggrandizement is not the best way of doing it because it's going to end up with lots of people dying. Um, and it's very selfish. And it's it only serves one purpose, which is your purpose, not global harmony. And certainly not, it's not a humanitarian purpose. So the Americans started supporting Chinese efforts to uh, push back against the Japanese. Now, there's a, there's a lot involved here. There's a, uh, a, a what I describe as a missionary complex. Americans had a bit of a missionary complex towards China. There is a sense that there is an American missionizing um, involvement in China, which is very important. But America saw China as the victim, as indeed it was, and wanted to help. So the Lend-Lease Act, when it first came into play, was actually designed to support or provide military support to China. American support to China arrived because it couldn't come in from the Pacific. Uh, it came in via Burma, and it came in via what was called the Burma Road. It came into Rangoon port. It was then transported by rail up to a place called Lashio on the Chinese border, and it, it was then traveled by uh, rail from Lashio, Obamo, into Chongqing, the capital of Yunnan province. And that whole journey was, that whole road was called the Burma Road. It was very, very, very important for America to be able to support China. And if you look at the whole of the grand strategy, the Allied grand strategy in the war, it was to support China. Because by 1941, we had very large numbers of Japanese troops being held down by the nationalist government, the Chinese government under a chap called Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek's had a bit of a rough ride, actually, historically, not least of all by the man who Roosevelt sent out to, or actually General Marshall sent out to be the American representative, uh, General Vinegar Joe Stilwell, who was absolutely the wrong man for the job. There's there's no doubt about that. He, he went out uh, 
without realizing the really important political role he had to play in gelling America and China together to fight Japan. Instead, he went out there as a bit of a bookkeeper, a bit of an accountant. He wanted to make sure there wasn't any graft on the Burma Road, and it wasn't really his role. Uh, and he got really angry at that American tax dollars were being wasted. It, it was almost an irrelevant, and he had he had a bit of a dark heart, dear old Vinegar <laughs> Joe. And he, he <laughs> not, not, so polite. Joe. You're so polite. He's not called Honey Joe. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But he did. You know, the Brits got, didn't couldn't stand it because they thought he only hated Brits. He hated everybody. He hated. Everybody. <laughs> But it, 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 was a, it was a really serious mistake by George uh, C. Marshall, Marshall to send him out uh, as the representative of America. But it's really important. This whole thing, we, we have lost sight in, in historical terms of the importance of China to defeating the Japanese, because our narrative about the Second World War in the Pacific is about the Pacific and it's about the island hopping campaign. And we, and this is a problem for historians as well. I fall into this trap, I fall into it in the past, and we do it all the time of sort of isolating our, 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 our narratives, our historical analysis and our stories around battles and about, around campaigns. We've got to step back and look at it in the round. And strategically, it's a really, really fascinating part of the world because we're there uh, mainly, well, we're there in Burma because of China. There's no other reason for it. The British weren't there in um, Burma or in India on the edges of Burma from 1942 onwards to recover its lost colony. Not at all, even though there were some wags in America who used to call Southeast Asia Command, save England's Asian colonies. Not at all. We were there, the Brits were there rather, to support the grand strategic um, okay. imperative to support China. It's really, really important that we understand that. Look, if China wasn't, if Daryl Chiang Kai-shek didn't have his 30 divisions fighting off the Japanese, the Japanese had about a million men at the time, then those troops would have been available to fight the Americans in the Pacific and to fight the British uh, in and around Burma. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, very important part of the relationship holding China um, to our bosom. Britain didn't really uh, understand China, and it didn't invest enough in understanding China before the war. It always had a bit of anomalous relationship with China at the start of the war, right, right through to early 1942, had a very difficult relationship. And it didn't, it didn't, as I said, it didn't spend enough time really thinking about the war and about the strategic issues facing China from China's perspective. As a strategist, the first thing you do is you ask, well, you know, what is their view? What, why are they doing what, they, what they're what they doing? Why why do they think they need to do what they, they need to do? And there was this di division between Britain and, and America. Really, I would say because Britain never fully understood the China dimension. Well, I, you know, one of the things that really kind of strikes you when you read the book is you have this vast conflict with millions of Asian people and lots of Westerners not really understanding what's going on and they seemed a little perplexed that you know, they might some of these people in in, the, in this theory of war might have some of their own opinions and own objectives and own, um, and that 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 dissonance dissonance at least at the start of the campaign I found really striking. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's it's a real challenge, isn't it? I mean, one of the I, I'm quite critical of the, the the British at the start because they had a, an empire they couldn't afford, and they couldn't afford to defend. I mean the first and most fundamental responsibility of any of any state is to protect its citizens even if it's a colony your responsibility is to make sure that you're protected from invasion and of course um, britain ran its empire on the cheap britain's empire was largely a commercial enterprise and the most important thing was making money for all the uh, the enterprises involved Going and, back to the days when your pub was constructed, I might yeah, add. So yeah, the absolutely. Oh, right. Just yeah, needed yeah, to yeah. bring yeah. that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I need to de de deconstruct my pub. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it's, it's a very good point. I mean, the problem was Britain, you know, when it got it right, it got it, it fabulously right. And I, But I think the problem... In, there is, a, there is a general problem about the 1920s and 30s. In fact, it's the subject of a book that I'm trying very hard to research now, which is the state of the British Army between 1918 and 1940. And the real problem in, in the 1930s in the Far East is that no one sat down and said, OK, what do we need to protect these colonies? So India, Malaya, Singapore, Hong Kong. What do we need to 
um, protect them from. Who is the likely enemy? Well, a lot of people said, well, the likely enemy is Japan, but because that became, that was such a um, uh, an unusual concept, but people then said, well, it couldn't. We could the Japanese couldn't possibly um, come and invade us. Why do we need to worry about it? That was a fundamental mistake. You know, the, the business of deciding strategy is is one that requires a lot of effort and a lot of thinking and some some real um, some real intellectual horsepower. And that was never undertaken. No one actually sat down and said, OK, here's here's our analysis. And as a consequence of this analysis, we've decided we're going to need a fleet in Singapore to fight the Japanese. We're going to need an army here. And actually, we think one of the threats might be that the Japanese invade us through Thailand or, or, or have an amphibious landing from uh, Indochina. None of that serious thinking took place. I mean, that's one of the things that actually after the Second World War, both Britain and America actually started to do quite well. And I think it's a, it's a lesson of the so what's of, of strategic thinking. If we've got a strategy, we then say, well, so what? How do we defend ourselves? You know, we, we the British Empire and America, were so flat-footed in 1941 and 42 because no one had actually put the effort into thinking about where the, the war might be and actually what sort of war we'd be facing. There's a lot of racism. There's no doubt about that in all the reports that you read through the 1930s and 40s. You know, the in the early 1940s, the Japanese surely couldn't fight a, a first-class or as they called it, a peer enemy. Um, they were, um, they'd been held up by the Chinese. They couldn't defeat the Chinese. Therefore, they'd be, you know, there's no way they could um, cause a threat to us Westerners. The arrogance really was quite profound. Um, but then again, it's, um, it's quite an extraordinary story, really, because the <laughs> Japanese, as I keep on saying, their effort to invade Southeast Asia in 1941, we didn't realize at the time, was the last blast of the Japanese trumpet. They had no greater effort left after they invaded. They were largely exhausted, to be honest, and they didn't have the effort, material effort, they didn't have the ships or anything to be able to transport all their booty back to Japan, because the rationale for the invasion, of course, was to be able to provide oil, rubber, tin, rice, bauxite, wolfram, and so on, in order to support Japan. Actually, it was to support the Japanese army in China. Sure. That, was, that was the reason for it. But of course, the Japanese didn't uh, have the shipping to be able to take all this stuff back. There was very little exploitation of the vast resources in the Far East. Um, what happened was that they fired their last blast. They got out to Java, Sumatra, Singapore, Malaya, Burma, Philippines, and sat there exhausted. I mean, that's the story. You know, from from the time yeah. which um, the uh, the Great battles took place on in Guadalcanal at the end of 1942, southern 1943. The Japanese were just being rolled back. It was a terrible, terrible story, of course, and the fighting was awful. But strategically, there was no longer any story. Strategically, the war was won in mid-1942. It just it took a very long time for the Japanese to realize it. Rob, I want to jump. Oh, sorry. No, no. I want to I, I jump in now and mm. bring in a question from our audience. And this one's uh, from uh, Skip Cornett. And um, his basic question is about what role, if any, did religious affiliation play into building that huge volunteer Indian yeah. army that you described for us earlier? Because, yeah. I mean, I think in, in the in the 21st century, we all know how, how strongly felt many of these religious affiliations yeah. are. Well, I, I would say none whatsoever, Skip. Great <laughs> question. I know none, none whatsoever. And it's a really, I mean, I've in, interviewed hundreds of Japanese uh, Indian veterans over the years. Now, one of the really interesting questions for me was, why did you join up? Why did you join this army? And it uh, became very clear in one of my first interviews that actually, uh, men were joining the Indian Army or the Indian Air Force in order to defend India. They weren't doing it to defend British interests. They weren't doing it to defend this concept of the Raj. Most people didn't even think about it. They were joining the legally constituted Army of India to fight a threat to India. And one of the first uh, interviews I ever had uh, was really, really revealing for me. The uh, veteran said to me, Rob, Rob, we knew all about the Japanese. We knew about Nanking. We didn't want the Japanese in India. It terrified us. So the reality is the vast bulk of Indians who joined the Indian Army when the recruitment campaign began in 
And remember, large numbers joined after the loss of Singapore in February 1942. This is really important. Of these two and a half million men, a very, very large percentage joined after it appeared that the whole British Empire had collapsed and failed. Why did they then join the Indian Army? Because they weren't fighting for the British Empire. They were fighting to defend India from the Japanese. It's a really, really important point. And we, we have lost sight of it over the years. Uh, and it's very interesting, you know, Indians of every kind, every caste, every background, every religious affiliation joined the Indian Army in large numbers. And it's a really interesting story about the Indian uh, recruitment campaign because it was pretty light touch. Large numbers of Indians joined of their own volition. There, there wasn't the sort of campaigning that you saw in Africa, for instance, in other British colonies, where uh, tribal leaders would be given a quota of recruits to, to, to bring together. And it wasn't really like that in India. One of the most amazing things about the Indian Army was that in 1938, 1939, at the start of the Second World War, the Indian Army was about 200,000 men strong, and it was largely, about 40% was recruited from um, the northeastern states, the Punjab and so on, um, from races who the British uh, regarded to be good soldiers. They called them the martial races, good soldiers and loyal. And um, and they were good soldiers, and they were loyal, and, and, and actually phenomenally good soldiers. The increase required for the Indian Army, that this massive expansion from 1942, uh, involved uh, Indians being recruited from right across India, from places that had never recruited into the Indian Army before. So by 1945, in a nutshell, we have an, we actually had an army for the first time that really did represent India. This is phenomenally important in the creation of this new sense of what India is, where it's going. These Indians joined because they want they 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 saw uh, a need for India to be protected, and they responded to that. It's a really interesting point you make, Skip. Um, let me just give you an example of how this worked. Combat units in the front fighting um, at at the end of a very long line of communication in India in 1944, and then Burma in 1945 would. The, 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 the logistical and administrative element of the army would try very hard to make sure that all the, um, uh, the, the catering culinary eating needs of the soldiers, there are 38 different scales of food, were met uh, for those particular individuals. But often it failed. But by 1945, all Indian soldiers in the front line fighting the, the enemy ate whatever food came their way they had whatever they, they applied whatever religious dispensations were required but it was quite extraordinary because this act itself and it's exactly the same with muslim soldiers and hindu and sikh soldiers it worked to bring them together in a really remarkable way because this had never happened before the old british army uh, sorry the old uh, indian army in its old dispensation before 1939 had kept the the castes and the uh, religious uh, orders completely separate. Uh, by 1945, they had merged into a quite homogenous uh, grouping. And al although those religious and cultural distinctions never were never removed, of course, you're, you're a Sikh soldier, you're a Gurkha soldier, you're a Pathan. You know you, that didn't that didn't change, but you ended up eating the same food where necessary, and uh, sub subliminating all those previous cultural. Um, uh, issues uh, to the importance of, of fighting together against the Japanese. And it's really, I mean, all the memoirs you read and, and, and all the histories you read about the Indian Army in 45, it's like that. It became really a powerful organization, culturally and militarily. And uh, just another thing about this, this Indian Army, it's really interesting that, you know, so in 1939, it was essentially a... Um, a constabulary to support the military aid of the civil authorities in India and to provide 1939, 1938-39, they created the 4th Indian Division, which was a deployable division, which was designed to support uh, British forces elsewhere in the empire. 1945, of course, it was very different. We had a very, very large Indian army focused almost exclusively, with the exclusion of Italy, focused on defeating the Japanese in the Far East. And... Um, it, as I said, it involved men from right across India, every caste and, and tribe and, and nation. And this this was really, really important. It was a new army 
that had been trained in 1943 and early 1944 that also proved to be phenomenally successful in battle. And this is really quite extraordinary. I mean, the Indian Army is a phenomenal machine and it, it had proved itself, it really did prove itself in 1944 in those great battles you can you can read about. I even go so far as to say, you, if you take any of those, the 33rd Indian Corps or the 4th Indian Corps in Burma 1945 and put it in Normandy, it would have behaved fabulously. It would have done everything that Monty or Patton would have required, or Eisenhower would have required of an uh, American or British or Canadian Corps in Northwest Europe. It had really well-trained infantry. These are soldiers who had trained for 11 months, recruit training, 11 months, amazing. Um, they were they were armored infantry. They, they were used to traveling with armor in a way that even British troops in 1944 weren't until the kangaroos arrived. Um, they were used to coordinating infantry and armor and mobile artillery and air power together. In 1945, all the battles in Burma were undertaken with cab ranks of typhoons and hurry bombers in the sky on permanent attachment to the ground troops. I mean, it was a really incredibly well-oiled machine. And the battles of Mactila and Mandalay in 1945, you know, are really up there with any of the others that um, you can compare with. In, in Europe, which is really extraordinary. This all happened very quickly. And I, I laugh with my friend James Holland in particular. I think, look, it's very interesting, James. We've got an army in 1944, an Indian army, a very large Indian army, 87% Indian. Um, that's actually, these, these guys were in short trousers at the start of the war. These are guys who were trained in 1943. And it's the same, really, as the British army in Normandy in 1944, which is a new army. These are 18, 19 year olds who'd been trained up in 43 to, for D Day. Uh, there were very, very few units, actually, uh, who had any longer experience of fighting than that. And they didn't particularly fare very well. So th th it's really amazing how quickly the Indian Army was built up, transformed, innovated and trained, put into battle. Wow. And did it smash the Japanese? I mean, one of the extraordinary things here is in, I then asked myself, well, why were the Japanese actually so brilliant in 1942? Well, yeah, that was one of my questions. And then they're so and bad in 1944. So bad in 1944, yeah. Well, hubris, I think, is the only answer to that, Chris. Um, the Japanese army uh, had one blast of the shotgun, as I describe it, in 1941-42. It was a very, very well-planned and organized campaign. 1941, December 1941 through to February 1942, the Japanese did far better than they expected because they weren't faced by a viable opposition. It was a, they had spent a whole year preparing for this extraordinarily. The army, the Navy, who were always, always at each other's throats, hated each other. The Navy actually transported the army to Malaya and the Philippines and, and, and Borneo and so on. Um, they worked together very good for this, very well for this operation. It was very well executed. And all the really, um, you know, the, the things that, uh, bring an army together and enable it to be successful were achieved by the Japanese in 1942. They knew their enemy. They knew how to overcome the enemy in battle. All their basic military drills were first class. The infantry was first class. They were tough and hardy. They integrated their machine guns, their infantry, the artillery and the air power very well. They had a massive preponderance of air power in all the theaters of war in 1942. Um, but they sat on their laurels. They then, you know, with Burma in their back pocket, Philippines and Malaya, Borneo, Java, Sumatra, they did diddly squat, I'm afraid. <laughs> they did diddly squat in part Is that because an they were. official military. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really important part of our military doctrine. Okay. There are two parts. Let me just describe two parts. Well, the first bit is really interesting. Look, politically, the rationale for the Southeast Asian co-prosperity sphere was to create a Japanese empire. But it was that was all border dash. It was noise. It was political noise. There was zero substance to it. If you look at the Japanese archives and the Japanese material, there was very little written about what the co-prosperity sphere would constitute. There were no civil servants, for instance, appointed to manage the co-prosperity sphere. There were no economists. It was, it, there was no administrators. There was nothing organized to actually bring this together. What happened after 1942 is that the military, the army, remained in control. It largely sat on its backside, consolidating what it had and, and, and making up military control of its territories. The Philippines are a really good example. Malaya, Singapore and Burma, great examples of the military just doing what it thought was right and ignoring anything that came from Tokyo. Um, not doing anything to send ships back because they didn't have the ships. And of course, Pacific was by then, by middle of 1942, an American lake. 
and uh, and uh, the, the attrition against Japanese shipping was absolutely extraordinary. By the end of 1943, wow, you know, you did not want to be a Japanese ship <laughs> in the Pacific. Seriously, there were ambushes all over the place. Um, but the problem was that there was no political um, plan to make any sense of what the Japanese had achieved. But the real problem militarily is that the Japanese only had one idea about fighting the war, which was effectively shock action. This what they call the Kiramoni Sakusan, this massive um, blinding attack against a defenseless enemy. They learned a lot from the Germans in France in 1940 and Poland in 1943. General Yamashita had actually visited with a delegation of Japanese commanders in 1940 to France. The Germans uh, took them around the battlefield and showed them what was um, how they conducted Plan Yellow and defeated the French and the, the, the British in Northwest Europe. And the Japanese applied exactly that to their invasion of Southeast Asia. They did nothing thereafter. They didn't develop their tactics. They did nothing really to understand what the British were doing and that the British and the Indians and the Americans were doing. Uh, and yet it was very obvious. It would have been very obvious if they had applied their minds to it because by 19, early 1944, the entire Allied position in the theater, which Americans call the Seabury Theater, had changed dramatically. It was, it now constituted very large numbers of very well-trained, mainly Indian, some Chinese, some British, some African, and some American soldiers. In fact, let me just tell you that at the end of the war, the 1.3 million men in Southeast Asia Command, Allied Land Forces Southeast Asia, they were more Americans in LFC than they were Brits. There were about 100,000 Brits and nearly 300,000 Americans. Most of those Americans were working on the Humpe airlift. But, you know, in the totality of the war, you know, this is a very big American operation. The Americans and the, um, the, the Allies did a huge amount to retrain, understand what the Japanese were doing, build themselves up, get proper equipment, um, do an enormous amount to conquer the, the biggest challenges, which were logistic. I mean, the, the logistical challenges of fighting in Burma were unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like, I mean, the, the war in, um, if, I, if I put it like this, the war in, um, well, in 1944, in Falkohima, it's a little bit like it was being sustained from Calcutta, the major logistical base mm. uh, on the Bay of Bengal. It's a little bit like fighting a war in Krakow from London. Just think <laughs> about that. You've got about 800 miles. You know, you've got to sustain everything up the Brahmaputra Valley or by one road, no bridges across the Brahmaputra, one another technical word, crappy little railway line that changed <laughs> gauge between uh, between Gahati and the Brahmaputra and on the other side to Dimapur. One road from Dimapur, 130 odd miles to Man uh, to, into Manipur. You know, it was unbelievable. The way the Allies won, not just because they had, you know, 1944, by having a fabulously well-trained army who knew they could defeat the Japanese in a straight fight whenever required, and they did every time from February 1944 uh, four onwards, Japanese never won the battle. Was air power, was integrated artillery, tanks, and armor and cab ranks a fighter ground attack? I mean, it really was very, very sophisticated. There's a funny story of General Lease coming in. He commanded the Eighth Army in Italy. Didn't do particularly well. He came out to um, the Far East, and a British general came out to the Far East in November 1944 to take over uh, command of Allied Land Forces of Southeast Asia, writing home to um, uh, General Allenbrook saying he didn't really think that the officers in the 14th Army really understood how to fight a, uh, a, a proper combined arms battle. Uh, and yet the whole story of 1945 was just unbelievable rhythm and synchronicity in the, in the fighting, all organized by men who had to make it up at the time but knew what, the, what they had to do. I mean, General Slim, Bill Slim, who commanded the army, was really an exceptional commander. Uh, and to give Gen um, Vinegar Joe Stilwell his, um, oh, well, well, that was pretty well synchronized. But to give, uh, <laughs> that's, that's General Slim. Uh, yeah, that's General that's Slim. not Vinegar Jill Still. It's no, Vinegar no, that's, Still. Uh, uh, and quite, quite a remarkable man, yes. Uh, on the left-hand side, he's at the Mandalay um, uh, Victory Parade in um, March 1944. This is well before the the war was over, of course. Uh, they were just about to begin their massive onslaught down to um, uh, Tungu and to Rangoon, uh, which they reached 
uh, by the end of oh, by the start of May. That's the distance between sort of Paris and Marseille, um, and uh, and there he is on the right hand side when his chief of the general staff. He, he he was an Indian army officer, but he got to the top of the British army after the war, and uh, but. Uh, and to give Finnegan Joe Still his, Stillwell his due, actually, he did an amazing job in training his Japanese troops, um, up to 75,000 of them, so by 1945, they were able to make, 1944 rather, uh, good progress down the route of the uh, Stillwell Road, that road from Lido. It sounded like road. you said Japanese troops, and I'm sure that's not what you said. Chinese. Did Chinese. I say Japanese? I, I might have misheard it. No, I no, I, 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 I often go so fast, I, I get them mixed up. Rick is uh, like the grammar teacher in the History Happy Hour. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I'm, no, I'm just trying well, to keep things straight in my head. Yeah, no, it's, well, I mean, you're doing a really good job because the one thing that uh, people always say to me is, Rob, it's just so confusing, and it is. So the way, the way to deal with understanding Burma is just to sit back and say, okay, what were we doing there? We were doing, we were there to support China. The main way of supporting China, uh, keep the pressure of the Japanese, was the hub airlift. And also, you know, the, the operations that took place in 1943 and 44 were designed to take pressure off China. So the Chindit expeditions were designed to take pressure off China. There was no plan, actually, to reinvade Burma, although Chiang Kai-shek wanted the British to do it. It was just not physically possible. We didn't have the troops or the, uh, the resources to be able to do anything like that. The, the reason it happened at all is because of the failure of the Japanese invasion of India in 1944, uh, the uh, Japanese um, offensive, which they described as the March on Delhi Operation C or Operation Ugo. And um, that was an extraordinary story. And I cover it in the book. You know, the um, people had been scratching their heads in 1943 and 44 about how on earth Burma would be recovered and the, and the Burma Road rebuilt. Um, until then, the only way to do that was to continue the airlift, the hump airlift, and to bulldoze this amazing road from Lido across the Patkoi Ranges down to Michinar. I mean, what an amazing uh logistical ex exercise that was. I mean, that was really extraordinary and only took place because of American industrial capacity. And I have to say chutzpah. I mean, the American, the British... I like all these big that. words he uses. <laughs> <laughs> I well, want to see these in the next book. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there is a funny story. When my boys were young, I used to come up with a word and I'd say, right, I'm going to put that in the next book. And they would then have to read the book to find the word. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, I, I had a question. Um, yeah. You talk about this a little bit in the book. Um, and I want to add that you know, we're talking a lot about like big topic stuff, but this is also mm. an amazing account of the campaign and the actual fighting involved. But we can't cover it all. So um, mm. one of the things that I was really curious about is – Given the overwhelming number of Indian and African troops in this army, given the fact that, as you clearly explain, it's an Indian army, how is this army and the war remembered in India yeah, and Africa it's today? It's a great question. Well, I mean, I, this is a question I've been battling with for years, and, uh, and my friends in India will laugh when they hear this because it's a, re a constant refrain of mine. Uh, I think the real problem when you look, we all have this problem of narratives in our in our history. We look at a history in a particular way. We look at it in a cultural or a national context. And um, because India uh, gained its independence in 1947 and then immediately split between India and Pakistan, a part of Pakistan, of course, was East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. The Indians, um, um, there was a war in 1951 in which... Um, Pakistan was forced to give up, and uh, East, pa East uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh became independent. I'd be very careful about how I explain that. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, and that's important. So, so what was India now is now in three parts, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And those narratives, those national narratives about where we come from, who we are, where we're going, uh, really all start in 1947 with independence. And that's really important in, in a historical sense, because not necessarily for bad reasons. Uh, Amer uh, Indians traditionally start their history by saying, well, we had a Mughal period, we had a chaotic period, a colonial period, and we now have an Indian period that started in 1947. So there's almost a sense of year zero in 1947, because anything before 1947 is regarded by many Hindu nationalists, not all of them, as being colonial and therefore oppressive and therefore 
you know, the Indian army was fighting for Britain, not for India. I completely reject that argument. I don't think there's any evidence for it whatsoever. Um, but it's an important part of the historical narrative. And I'm really excited to say that in India, there's a large number of uh, academics and ordinary people now who are looking at the Second World War uh, with a new sense of, of ownership and bringing it into their, their cultural narrative and saying, actually, these people were fighting for what was then um, pre-partition India, and they were fighting because, as I demonstrated in the book, they were fighting to protect India and what they regarded as their country and the future of their country from totalitarian, straight fascist aggression. That's really important. They weren't fighting for the British. They weren't fighting because they were told to. They weren't fighting because um, they were mercenaries. They were fighting of their own volition for the right reasons. And I think that's really exciting. And it is exciting that people, particularly in Pakistan, we talked to a lot of people over the years in Pakistan and India who are now seeing the war from a, a more enlightened perspective. And that's mm. really important. But there's an equal problem, Chris, as well. It's not just India. Go to Britain and people say, well, you know, that was the Indian army. That wasn't anything to do with us. You know, it, it, it's, re <laughs> it, it, it's the opposite problem. And you do have people in, in Britain and America who argue the, the uh, you know, who make the argument that, of course, the Indians were fighting for the wrong reasons. And there's no evidence for that whatsoever. They were fighting for India. And I'm, I'm delighted to be able to write that and discover it and say it because it needs saying we need to rescue this history for indians we need to rescue it for for brits and americans as well so they see the really important part that india played and africa as well played in the war against the japanese because actually when i look as a historian and i look at the second world war now i see the war in uh, eastern europe really well covered i see it globally war in eastern europe really well covered people understand the dynamics at play we look at the northwest theater of operations as you guys call it and we see the dynamics at play the great alliance between america and britain to uh to defeat the german armies in western europe and to advance into germany first of all of course into mussolini's italy in 1943 via sicily and then we go back and we look at that great campaign in north africa which culminated in operation torch and ended in may 1943 so that's all really coherent and then if we go to the pacific we've got a really coherent pacific campaign which effectively starts with midway then goes to guadalcanal and then moves up island by island all the way till we get to okinawa and iwo jima and then of course the main islands what's missing there's well, this it, huge yeah. gap between the middle east and the Pacific, and it's called the CBI Theatre for you Yanks, <laughs> or the Far Eastern Theatre, the Burma Campaign. And it's really important to hold it all together because the centrality to all of this is China. If we didn't have China, you know, you'd have many, many more Japanese. I mean, it's going to be a really difficult challenge, actually, when, when we as the Allies get to Japan in the first place. July 1945, mm -hmm. a million more Japanese join their home guard in order to fight the impending war. I mean... And, you know, the Japanese are fighting to the death. So Japan, uh, China is a really, really important constituent part of the ent entire story here. The Burma campaign, Bill Slim, Vinegar Joe Stilwell, and all those million and 1.3 million men and women fighting the Japanese in India and Burma, fundamentally important to the whole global picture. And my sense as a historian is that we've just lost that. There's a big gap. Yeah, And, you know, on the, on the academic front, there are very few academics actually doing serious work on the war in the Far East. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, it's funny. The, the army always called itself the Forgotten Army, the 14th Army, yeah. because by the time the newspapers got to the Far East, it was six weeks since they were published in London. And there was the boys would go through them, flick through the newspapers, and there'd be nothing ever said about them. Now, that was remedied by 1944. Um, but that uh, sobriquet is stuck, the Forgotten Army. And you know, it was a long way from home. It was it was seen to be peripheral. You even have really famous uh, historians like Max Hastings getting out there and saying it actually wasn't very significant at all. Uh, the evidence is completely contrary to that. The evidence is that this was a very significant campaign and the Japanese needed to be defeated. Let me give you some evidence for that. Uh, when I uh, first went to Japan to meet these Japanese veterans, uh, couple of visits that were very kindly set up for me and then in subsequent conversations with them uh when the japanese think about the war the second world war and they talk about it and it's now a, a new generation but when the older generation talk about the second world war 
in my experience, they don't talk about Iwo Jima or Okinawa or Guadalcanal or anything like that. The, the sense when they describe the war, they use one word and it's Imphal. Now, Imphal, capital of Manipur, was the site of the great campaign against um, the Allies in 1944, the invasion of India. And it was also the site of the destruction of the 15th Army. 100,000 men came in and about 60,000 were lost. Massive, massive humiliation for the Japanese. So the Japanese see Imphal as a humiliation. This is the first time a formed up Japanese army that had won. I mean, the 15th Army was the army that had won Burma in 1942, completely decimated, really destroyed quite comprehensively. And um, that's very humiliating. And as I said at the start, they were defeated by an Indian army. That's even worse. Mm. But it's really important to bear this and put this into context. At the end of the war, and I, I make this, I don't make this argument in the book, but I've made it many places, uh, in, in other places and uh, in various podcasts. I argue that, you know, when, you, when Hirohito um, was thinking about bringing the war to a close, at, at the end, once Nagasaki and Hiroshima had taken place, and remember many more people had been killed earlier in the year in the firebombing of Tokyo, but we had you know, quite significant devastation of Japanese cities. But what we also had was the destruction, the complete loss of Japanese armies in India in 1944 and the Japanese loss of Burma in 1945. So in March and April, uh, well, February and March 1945, the Japanese had been defeated on the Irrawaddy shore for the second time in as many months. They'd been defeated at Kahima and Infal, they were defeated at Mandalay, Mactila, two formed up Japanese armies destroyed. 1945, right at the end, the Russians come sweeping into Manchuria in a lightning campaign under General Zhukov and smash the Japanese as well. So if you're General Hirohito, you're sitting here and you've got the war party led by, Hiro, by T General Tojo, the prime minister, arguing that we should keep continue fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. What forces you to stop? What makes you want to pull the plug? Well, what makes you want to pull the plug is the fact that you know, you know that this bubble of militarism has burst. Your armies have failed you. It's not just the bombing of the cities, which is terrible enough, but you've got nothing else. The armies aren't going to save you. This idea that militarism is the primary virtue in society and is going to make Japan great has been proven to be rubbish. And the night before he makes the announcement that Jap Japan has surrendered, this is Hirohito, you've got members of the, of the War Council trying to kill him in the palace in Tokyo. Quite an extraordinary story. Mm. But this is really important, I think, to understand. If the Japanese had not, the Japanese armies had not been defeated so comprehensively, first under Mojiko Jirenya, and then under General Kimura in, in, um, uh, in 1945, the, 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 the issue for Hirohito would have been quite different, I think. And I think that, that there's a, it's, it's a really, really important thing. When you consider how quickly Japan turned on its, um, completely changed direction after the war under General MacArthur and completely adopted a Pacific aspect to its development and growth and got rid of militarism completely. Pacific I mean, it's, as opposed to militarism, right? Pacific as opposed to military, yes. It, right. it was became became very anti-military. Right. Really quite an extraordinary change from what had been the dominant culture of the time. Rob Lyman, thank you so much for joining us today on History Happy Hour. If only we could find a guest who was passionate and knowledgeable about this area <laughs> really. and, and could talk well. That would be good. But but until that person comes along, you'll do. Uh, <laughs> thank you very we, much. But no, we really appreciate it. And uh, Rob Lyman's book is A War of Empires, one of his many uh, great uh, books. Uh, Japan, India, Burma, and Britain, 1941 to 1945. Check it out. And again, Rob, thank you so much for joining us on History Happy Hour from your former 1776 pub. <laughs> it's been we an absolute it. pleasure to be with you this, uh, this, this afternoon. All thank right, you so thank much. You so and let, much. Us, let us know about the next yes. book as well. Absolutely. Cheers. Mine's yeah, empty. I certainly will. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Be well. Take care. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye-bye then. Bye-bye.
Oh, well, the the Forgotten Theater or Forgotten Army, which which of course Rob rejects the Forgotten Army label, but oh. still, uh, uh, you know, I think at least now we've remembered this theater a little bit more than we had before. Absolutely, there and this, you know, please check out the book because there's just so wonderful nuances. We talked a lot about you know the Indian Army and Indian nationalism and all those topics, but there's also a fantastic narrative of the campaigns and the personalities involved, and you really need to to look into it. Yes, and so that's uh, it's a, and it's quite a, an extensive telling. So it's a very complete picture of the of the theater there. That if you're like me, you just don't know very much, or I didn't know very much no. about it until I started looking at this book. So uh, that's fantastic, Chris. I wanted to mention uh, for for people who are left for the hardcore audience who's sticking mm-hmm. with us here past the hour. Look, we just went past the hour. Yeah. Uh, uh, as discussed uh, a little bit on Facebook, you and I both have brand new tours that we, we are do. trying to launch uh, yeah. next year. And I want to see if I can pull up uh, yeah. the, the page from the Stephen Ambrose window here. Uh, so and so you have a tour in the first week of May, which is a, an SOE tour. Now, the SOE yes. was involved in this campaign in Burma, but you're not going to Burma. But what, not are, yet. You, what, what, what are you thinking about doing? Well, this kind of grew out of our time in lockdown and uh, walking around London. It dawned on me that there were some amazing sites attached to the special operations executive and the men and women who served in it. And this led to uh, lots of research and tours around the UK. So we're going to do a, kind of a deep dive on the special operations executive and um, their operations in the establishment here in the UK. And you get to see some wonderful top secret sites and... Uh, it's, it's fascinating. And and initially, I thought that the tour, the new tour that I've developed, uh, was going to go the same week that they were pitting us against each other. And we all know who what would you pick. Uh, obviously, it would be clear who would win. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the tour that I'm doing, uh, um, uh, it says on the schedule dates to be announced, but the current date is actually going to be uh, is scheduled to be tentatively. It's going to be starting May 8th. So one technically could do the SOE tour and then back come to on back. the fly t- from London to Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and do the Revolutionary War road to Yorktown. And I think, you know, the 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 Civil War fighting in the south of the... Uh, Revolutionary War fighting in the south of the United States, um, this is a bit of a stretch. It has a little bit in common with the Burma campaign in that I think people don't really... They really don't know don't about know it. Don't know enough about it. No. People, people think, okay, there was Lexington and Concord, there was Bunker Hill, there was Saratoga, and there was the surrender at Yorktown. And there's this entire campaign that runs through South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, you have amazing battlefields like Cowpens and Kings Mountain. You have sieges. You have... People building uh, Roman-style siege towers to to carry uh, fortified works. You have all sorts of fascinating stuff going on. You've got the Swamp Fox. You've got Light Horse Harry Lee, and of course it ends with the surrender at Yorktown. And uh, and 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 I know Chris. I'm sorry to rub this in, but the the uh, British Army laying down their arms uh, you, to you know, Rick, the American. We talked about armies. this before the show. You said you were going to, you know. Be, above be gentle, board. but yeah, you had to take that little. You know, okay, I did. Fine. I did kind of have to go there. Fine. Didn't have to yeah. go there. So anyway, uh, those uh, we, we're both leading other tours as well. We encourage you to check out all the tours at the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours website and and come on as many as you feel like. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we did get a couple of comments from people who'd just been on your uh, tour in uh, Bestone Best and, yeah, uh, and uh, the Ardennes and who really. Most of them, I mean, really enjoy it. <laughs> most, of them. Yeah, most of them. So, um, and next week, I just want to say uh, we are going to take Christmas off, but we're going to have a um, uh, a little bit of a uh, of an encore show. It's going to be a, a show in honor of the Battle of the Bulge. We're going to rerun a show that we did about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, in which uh, Chris talks about uh, Lieutenant Dick Winters and Easy Company. Of course, as many of you know, he he knew Dick Winters and many of the men from Easy Company quite well, and uh, we he and I chatted about it in a History Happy Hour in Week Twenty Five, and Way so we are going to replay that show. It's, if you if you feel that Christmas is not complete without a little bit of Chris and Rick, that's going to be available to you there uh, on the Christmas Day History Happy Hour. So thanks everybody for joining thanks, us. Everybody. We really appreciate it. Stay safe. Thank <music> you.